Welcome back to Birds of a Feather Talk Together. For those of you that aren't familiar with our podcast, my girlfriend Amanda and I have gotten into birding in the past year and have been lucky enough to meet John Bates and Shannon Hackett, two experts in their field who also happen to be married. They are curators of birds in the Field Museum in Chicago and two of our favorite people to talk to. Each week they offer their knowledge on a different bird and we jump into a number of different topics related to that bird. Today we're excited to talk about the killdeer. Killdeer are a really cool looking shorebird that have two black bands across their chest. Their name is actually an onomatopoeia. Their call sounds like they are saying killdeer out loud. They are most known for their broken wing act, where they actually pretend like they are injured and have a broken wing to lure predators away from their nest. There are so many cool things about the killdeer, I'm pumped for you to listen to this one and learn more. We also talk about a study that's being done in California called Project Phoenix that's studying the effect that wildfires are having on birds. We cover this at the end of the episode. We were having a chat about the history of the Field Museum before the episode started, and our microphones were recording. We left that conversation in the beginning of the episode because I found it interesting. It's just a couple minutes, and then we get into the kill deer. Okay, now go get your binoculars, and let's get started. We were looking a little bit about the Field Museum. Is is the actual building from the World's Fair? No. No. Okay. Yeah, so it was built in 1921. 1921. So, so, so what okay. happened was the World's Fair happened was down in Hyde Park. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the building that the Museum of Science and Industry is in is the only building left from the World's Fair, oh, I so think. so that's from the World's Fair. Yes. Oh. And the Field Museum actually, the, the initial collections were actually on display in that building oh. until the 1921 building was was uh, was finished. You guys made your yeah. building. Okay, very yeah. cool. So it's interesting. So it, the the first bird, bird number one in the Field Museum collection was uh, I think the collecting collection date was about I think it's 1903. I think. Oh wow! And and we have older birds, but not. Right. Well, so, so we got all the mounts exchange. from the World's Fair, mm. and and those were in science and industry, and then were moved up to the Field Museum. Oh, but that's but they awesome. were you know the museum was sort of st- starting down in science and industry, and then oh, they realized I guess they I mean it's amazing that they found the money to build a monstrous building like that. Well, it was donated. Uh, yeah. The Field Museum? So, yeah. By yeah. The field family, it was Marshall right? Field, right? Yeah. yeah. We were just yeah. reading about that. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I love what you said about how it's like such a pain in the ass to articulate skeletons. That That's why you guys, the ones you have are really old. Oh, oh we yes. don't have enough staff. <laughs> to There's do. not enough staff in the world associated so, with natural history museums to re articulate. And then you wouldn't want to for very many things because people need the, to see the whole bone. Oh, and if you've articulated them, it's yeah. really hard to yes. for them to look at. Because if you want to look at those connections about how the neck is kinked, yeah. you need to see all of the bones by themselves yeah. to understand the articulations of nerves and muscles, things like that. So That's um, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it is really hard. If you look so, at a disarticulated pile of bones in a box and you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It remind we went into the room with Mary. You took us yeah. to the yeah, room with it, Mary, yep. and we saw like the piles you were talking about. It was crazy. <laughs> yes. yeah, we don't the, even the have enough staff to number them so that we can keep oh. all the pieces together. Yeah, let alone articulate them. That's... I would like to. I would sometimes I'd like ornithology students to do that because yeah. if you want to know how a bird gets together, works. Yeah, look at how you. Um, do that. I mean, I was a weird kid. I used to bring dead things home <laughs> and sit at the picnic table in my backyard and take their bodies apart, <laughs> which I know. They were already dead at part least, of though, right? The, yeah. They were dead squirrels that got hit by cars and things oh. like that. But I had to know how they worked. Yeah. So I took their bodies apart. Yeah. You know, my mom says I'm an unsub in an episode of Criminal Minds. <laughs> <laughs> Just that nobody knew how to label me when I was when I was little. But yeah, I mean to see it like that, that's why looking at birds up close is so amazing to yeah. see how their feathers all work and how their wings fold and how what their legs do. I mean we know what ours do, but birds don't they don't walk on the same parts of their feet that we do. So to understand where a bird's knees 
are is I think that's really cool. Yeah. That's really Did you ever take any kill deer apart when you were younger? No. No. <laughs> no, but I was literally at a dissertation defense day before yesterday that was about charadria forms. So the the order that kill deer are in. Oh, cool. and okay. This was a dissertation project that uh, a woman named Rossi Natali did and where she literally went out to collections around the country and I think in Europe too and, and got scans of the heads and bills of every species that she could get in the entire order and then did this big analysis of, of how those patterns differed in groups like the plovers, which is where the shorebirds are, or the killdeer are, and uh, uh, other shorebirds, the sandpipers, and then that family has the gulls and, and mm-hmm. uh, the alcids, or the, or, uh, which are ox and, and mirrors and murrelets and things. Okay, wow. So yeah, so there's some neat stuff you can do looking at evolution from the perspective of what's going on with variation in in skull morphology and bill morphology. Yeah, so how do you connect the behavior, the morphologies, the brains, all of these things into understanding how um, behaviors and the function, how did it evolve? So that's, you know, those are all comparative studies that you can do at collections provide you the opportunity to do and new technology lets you do it in ways that you couldn't do before. So CT scanning really opens up all of almost all of our understanding of how brains are evolving comes from our ability to CT scan specimens to really look in detail at inside. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise you would have to have a pickle and you'd have to have an institution let you take the whole thing apart. Oh, right. Okay. And we're not very it's not like we don't do it, but we're not very comfortable with big. that kind of destructive sampling, yeah. especially of birds that we don't have very many of. So using the technologies that are available to let you look inside, I think is really important. That's awesome. So is there anything with like the killdeer specimen that you have that you found that kind of differentiated them or changed the way you looked at them? Anything? That's an interesting question. What I would say about killdeer is they're part of this group of plovers that are kind of cookie cutters of one another. Mm-hmm. So the the bill shape and and body shape actually doesn't vary very much compared to their sister group, which are the the sandpipers, mm-hmm. because in the sandpipers you get into things like dowitchers and curlews and all kinds of things, whereas the plovers and killdeer are kind of insect eaters, where they're just kind of pecking as opposed to putting their bills down into the sediment and trying to find stuff that's buried down deep a little bit. Yeah, so the the feather characteristics in plovers are, you know, are a lot less variable. So how many stripes, how many black stripes are um, on the breast of these birds? How big is it? Things mm-hmm. like that. Because we think killdeer look pretty, like, exotic. exotic when we yeah. see killdeer, we, whenever we see them, we think we're like, oh, this looks it's like it's from a different Africa, from Africa or something. Or something. Yeah. We think that they're so well, cool looking. That's an interesting looking. way to describe it. I mean, the, the one thing about killdeer relative to most of the other plovers is they're one of the few species that, that has basically evolved the capacity to leave the, the aquatic areas. It's not that they're not associated often with water, but they can use a lot of different habitats. So you'll see them in farm fields and you'll see them in parking they actually, lots. They actually like parking <laughs> lots as, because, partly as a nesting substrate, but, but you know, they're, they're definitely have the capacity to go out and use terrestrial habitats a lot more than some of the other uh, plovers will do. I remember the first time I saw the broken wing display and I was really horrified I thought the bird was actually injured mm-hmm. you know they're very convincing in wandering around with that with their wings all twisted oh. out as if they're yeah so can you describe broken. exactly because I've seen videos on YouTube but uh, you know so basically to lure prey away from its its eggs it'll pretend away. like it's or, yeah. yeah predators it'll pretend like it's injured and kind of shake its wing um, and then it basically gets the predator away from yeah, the nest. Yeah, it's luring that... them away, thinking, okay, well, this is a b- injured bird. It's going to be easy prey, mm-hmm. so I'll follow it, and then I'll eat it. Um, yeah, you run into your own when you do that to a fox, though, or something like that, because was... then if you're a killdeer, a fox is going to eat you. Right. Um, they will actually <laughs> know that they can get that bird or you know other 
kind of display behaviors that are designed to make you seem more threatening even. So if you if the broken wing doesn't work, well, let me try puffing my whole body up and making you think I'm twice as big as I actually am. And that display so. was like equally fascinating, I thought. It kind of like has its wings out to the side and shows its tail. And is there, I think there's a color on the tail. Yeah, yeah they would love to have, yeah. And that's actually, I think, fairly unusual in the group in, in, in how distinctive that tail pattern is. It's, it's really dramatic. It kind of reminds me of a red-tailed hawk almost where it just, and it, it's, it, you definitely notice it. I mean, that's why you notice killdeer so much, because A, they're in a parking lot. So you, when you get out of the car at the hockey rink, there's a killdeer. <laughs> but <laughs> they also, they're not shy. They're not quiet. Um, and that's reflected in both their common names and their scientific names, killdeer, because of how they sound, and vociferans as their species name, because of how loud they are. Okay. So, because killdeer is an onomatopoeia, where it's it actually it sounds like it's saying killdeer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm always surprised. Every once in a while, you'll hear somebody go, "That does not what they sound like," and it's like, no, that is what they sound like. <laughs> that, that's one. That's one of the better descriptions I can come up with. I think it's a it's a great name. <laughs> Even for me, who's not very good at remembering bird songs, there's some part of my brain that doesn't like bird songs very much. A killdeer is one I don't have to go remind myself every every spring what that sound is. <laughs> John is very good at bird sounds, remembering them. And there are some people who are really amazing. I am not one of those people. Mm. Do you guys remember bird sounds no. very much? No, no. <laughs> not at all. We're getting better, but yeah. uh, there you still. Go. Yeah. You yeah. will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we did hear um, killdeer on our camping trip up in Wisconsin um, last month, I think. Yeah. And there was actually a beach um, at the campsite, and there are people everywhere. And there were killdeer that were on the side that had no problem with people being everywhere and just kept flying overhead and we kept hearing them doing their call yes and at the time it was before we knew that killdeer was an automatopoeia so now i kind of wish we were (laughs) because they were totally talking the whole time they were yeah Mm. they're adorable though too yeah yeah lots of shorebirds are really cute yeah and so they're uh they're nests too so they don't actually have nests is that right yeah basically they i think they might rearrange the pebbles a little bit, but they're just looking for a, a place in in the dirt that they sense is a good place to lay four eggs. And, and the eggs are incredibly well camouflaged. So, so the interesting thing is you can, because the birds will hang around, you can find killdeer nests more easily than you can a lot of other things because they're in the open and you just have to be really careful because literally they're concealed enough and the eggs are camouflaged enough that you could step on them before you actually see them, which you obviously would not want to do. But at the same time, I mean, they, they can you can often find killdeer nests much more easily than you can for almost any other bird I can think of wow. just because they're, they're out in the open. Is that common for all plovers or is that just kind of the killdeer that... No, it's, 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 it's common for, for all plovers. I mean, I, I think it's... Uh, parking lots? No. No, not parking lots, but 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 their plovers are 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 open country. I mean, even in uh, aquatic systems, they're more along the shorelines and and uh, and certainly you know a lot of them are migratory. So they're breeding at very high latitudes up in Alaska and and northern Canada and northern. They're a global, so they're they're all the way through uh, the old world too. Um, but those are nesting in tundra and things like that. Yeah, they basically just scrape some dirt or rocks away, and that's good enough for me. That's it. <laughs> Lay their eggs, and, and then. And the entire know. group is all their eggs are are spotted and and camouflaged, so they they they're matching the ground cover of the areas they nest in to some extent. It's really neat. Oh wow! And it, when they're uh, they're mating, they do the kind of the same thing make a little nest too is that right yeah so like they, 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 they scrape the female some... will just I, I wonder if that's kind of a preparatory thing just to i think it's part of the behavioral rituals of mating you know to do that because of what closely happens thereafter which if we're going to talk about bird sexes <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens after the little scrapey behavior thing okay. happens well i sent i was doing my research and sent amanda a picture and it was a <laughs> kill deer before they were ready to mate and it looked like one was like standing on the yeah. other shoulders yes <laughs> yeah 
which must be common, but yeah. it was I was like, is this uh, what yeah. we're going to talk about? It was. Well, I, mean, I think you if know, if you think about what has to touch each other, you know, most birds don't have penises, so they have to touch um, their cloacas together, and that, you know, it's, it's kind of a physical feat when you think about what has to happen for that to happen. Okay. But. <laughs> Kill deer, do it. Everything else does too. <laughs> it's nature. <laughs> the, the picture we saw, the caption was capulation, but it literally looked like. Right. No, no, they're standing <laughs> so on top. No, standing, it, 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 they were standing it, on yes. top of each other. Yeah. Right? Like, so, yeah. Is that like right before or right after? Or during? Really? Yeah. No, I mean, I, no, it, because yeah, you have to question, physically because, get those parts of your body close together. Oh, okay. I, you know, I think oh. they, they would actually kind of fold up. Okay. In order to copulate. So okay. that's what would happen. Yeah. So. Okay. Because what we looked at, they weren't. <laughs> yeah. They weren't, yes, they weren't doing it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. weren't close <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, technology will have more and more videos and pictures of such things that's if you're true. really interested in that. <laughs> It'll be out there. <laughs> so I read somewhere, too, that um, a lot of them nest, um, because they like nesting in gravel, that they'll do it up on, like, rooftops. And that they've kind of learned, like, that there's sometimes those gravel rooftops and that they'll build a nest up there, and then that's kind of become problematic because then they have to get down. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was just looking at a the, the, a video that I, I somebody sent me of, uh, it said, the title of the video is from a trail cam. It said, it's raining wood ducks, and wood ducks nest in trees. And one of the crazy things is the chicks have to get down to the ground. So they're evolved to do that. I would guess that that may not be quite as true as killdeer. So that may be a, a feat to get the chicks safely down to the ground once they're hatched, which may be one of the challenges with that. Okay. Um, yeah. But but they don't weigh anything, and so maybe they can actually drop 30, 40 feet down <laughs> if they have to. A lot of people who own buildings are not very happy if birds nest on the roof of their mm -hmm. buildings. I mean, a lot of them are protected, which means there's limited numbers of things you're allowed to legally do um, to them. So... And that it would include going out on your roof oh. because you're not supposed to be disturbing the the breeding cycles mm -hmm. of uh, protected birds. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you know, which you might not like if you're a building owner, which <laughs> plenty of people in Chicago don't like about ring-billed gulls, for example. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, but I, I think, yeah, killdeer are incredibly adaptable and, and – that's actually brings up another thing I wanted to mention, which is that we did this analysis of uh, egg laying dates and changes uh, over the last 100 years or so, 135 years, based on using data from the egg collection and then some modern data that a couple of colleagues of ours had gathered. And killdeer was one of the species that is absolutely nesting a month earlier now on average in the Chicago region than it was back in the period between 1880 and, and 1920 based on the egg laying dates in our you know, that you can calculate from eggs in our collection okay. which so, is and so they're they're you know one of the reasons why they're so successful they're found all the way across North America um, is literally because they're they're fairly adaptable they're one of the uh, they don't migrate very far in the winter so they leave the Chicago region, but they don't go farther than Louisiana or Texas to spend the winter and then come back. Okay. So if you had to guess how many we have in our collections, what would you guess? I'd say we probably have 800 to 1,000. Yeah, we have 500, a little oh, over 500. Yeah. One other thing I was going to say about eggs with respect to uh, shorebirds in general is they tend to have this uh, round and then base and then pointed tip and uh, that's an interesting thing in egg evolution and one of the hypotheses is that killdeer and a lot of charadri forms lay about four eggs at a time and that shape with the pointed tips actually allows for the eggs to be very close together which allows for incubation to go much better oh, okay. and be more effective which I think is a really neat aspect of, of shape evolution in eggs that I'd never thought about before we started looking into it with one of our one of our graduate students. And not all shorebirds are on the shores. So it might have be in a group of birds called shorebirds, but that that doesn't mean that they only live around oceans. So killdeer is really common in places in the interior parts of the country. Um, 
you don't need a shore to be a shorebird. Yeah, I think we didn't realize that about killdeer because we had seen them near water at the Botanic Gardens a lot. And then I think, John, we saw them out with you when we went to Van Patten Woods just out in a field. And I think you were telling us that it's kind of more common for them to be there right. or like near a parking lot. So yeah. that and was new to us. In yeah. general speaking, compared to a lot of the really long distance migrants. So, for instance, uh, in Avalon, there's a in New Jersey where we just were, there are migrant shorebirds coming through. And one of them is semi-palmated plover, which is a, another member of that group. And, you know, there can be 500 individuals spread out along the the coastline in one little area. Whereas with killdeer, you don't see that anywhere near as much. Although every once in a while, you can see groups congregating, for instance, on uh, soccer fields, um, where you can get 50 to 100 or so at a time after the breeding season, and they're starting to move south. Okay. Do they, I heard somewhere that they feed both at night and during the day, depending on the moon cycle. Is that is that true? I, I, I don't know how well studied that is specifically, but um, one of the neat things about their morphology is they have really big eyes, and uh, that's almost certainly an adaptation to for potentially for crepuscular activity. And so, yeah, I think that, that, that they probably are absolutely, it's safer probably at night from aerial predators and things like that. I mean, it's especially in open country. I mean, I'd look at it if, if you're going to have, if a broken wing display is something that you use to lure predators away from your nests, that's a, a very energy intensive behavior, right? You don't do that lightly. And so if you're going to forage like that at dark or around dark, you know, maybe you, you don't have to put as much energy into protecting so your, your nest can be a little more exposed for a little while while you're going out feeding. Oh, interesting. That makes sense. So that's yeah. what I think of when I hear that is it spends a lot of time defending. I mean, if you're going <laughs> to, if you're going to nest in a parking lot, <laughs> you're going to be doing a broken, and they do the broken wing at humans, right? So that's a lot of energy and a lot of stress associated with that. So their cortisol levels must go crazy when they are doing these displays. So it's got to be a lot less and, and at the same time, they're a bird that'll nest successfully in really small patches, seemingly that that in urban areas. So, so we've seen uh, broods at places like Eggers, uh, Eggers, uh, uh, Emily Oaks um, along the uh, power line right away. There's enough open space there to have. A killdeer put a nest in and and hatch some young and raise them up and 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 so it's yeah they're definitely adaptable and and I think your point was a really good one with respect to um, what they're doing in that sense because um, I think it's just an aspect of of with killdeer I was going to say I don't ever think of them as watching them forage and I can't think of very many birds I would say that about. Yeah, because when you see them, they're defending. Yeah, no, they're, they're always they're either running around or they're defending. You know, yeah. and, and they. Yeah. So I, I think we have a lot to learn about how birds uh, are resilient and and what stress does to birds and how environments, urban environments, influences how excess light influences these things. So I think there's probably a lot to learn about the influences of stress on killdeer versus other things that they're related to. Just to understand, you know how 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 you're resilient to changes, how you're resilient to such things. Yeah, I was gonna say it sounds stressful to be a killdeer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, when they were evolved, parking lots didn't exist. Right. So yeah. rocky areas still exist, fields still existed in a different kind of way. But you know, but if you can manage to live near humans, you you have a lot more habitat. You open up a lot more habitat for you to to potentially breed or feed in. This week, we're not going to do a mailbag question. We're actually going to talk about a study that's being done on how smoke from wildfires is affecting birds. Um, Shannon found this and sent it to us. But there's a, it's only in California right now. It's called Project Phoenix. And they are asking for people to participate in a study 
Um, you don't have to have a ton of experience as a birder. They're taking new birders, and it takes just 10 minutes a week. But if you look up Project Phoenix in California, they just are asking people to observe birds, and then they're doing a study during fire season from August to October um, just to determine how smoke is affecting birds with all the wildfires. So if you're going to Google it, it's... Um not the one that's associated with extraterrestrial life. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So <laughs> get the right search terms, uh, unless you're really interested in searching the Project Phoenix associated with extraterrestrial life. But this was started. We know the people who started this. Um, so there are there's a postdoc who's part of it uh, named Olivia Sanderfoot, and then Allison Schultz, who is kind of our counterpart at the L.A. County Museum and uh, another professor named Morgan Tingley. And they are kind of the project leaders. And if you look, I love the fact that all of the people involved are listed on their website. And you can see just all the different kinds of people, different backgrounds and experiences of the people that are involved in this. You know, California wildfires are a significant Mm -hmm. issue. And we don't know what happens. I mean, birds breathe, right? So do we. We don't do well in forest fires. And I imagine birds don't do so well either. But you have to get data. You can't just make claims about things without, well, you can. But they're better when they're backed by actual observational data. And so this, again, is a community science project that involves public databases, eBird, so everybody can contribute to our understanding of where birds go when there's fire, um, how that might change their breeding patterns, uh, the fire systems. And if you've been out west, you know how you're not so far away from the apocalyptic looks of um, what a world with too many fires, with a world with climate change like this might look like, that the sky is not blue, that there are particles that are not very good to breathe or ingest everywhere. And yeah, even in Chicago, it's overcast all the time. We're getting smoke from Canada. I mean, to be closer to the source, like in California, where it's all happening, it's got to affect them so much more, I would imagine. Yeah, and, and so much of it depends on c- kind of when it happens, you know, so for instance, if it's at the height of the breeding season, that's obviously going to be awful with respect to nesting. And uh, and so, you know, this whole idea of gathering data and monitoring what's going on is really valuable to, to be able to put together plans to, to help mitigate, mitigate it. And at the same time, you know, the truth of the matter is fire is natural at some level to some of these systems. And, and that's another aspect of the whole study that is really worth looking yeah. at. I mean, what happens if you take a fire frequency regime and then make it happen 10 times more frequently and have them be more extreme? You have to start somewhere. So we can bemoan that we haven't done some of these things for forever, but we have tools now and there's a lot of people who can contribute. So there are ways of gathering data now that we wouldn't have had 10, 15, 20, or 100 years ago for sure. But now we actually can do things so we can actually gather data and we can actually make a difference in this. And I hope that what they're doing spreads uh, like wildfire to other places and certain and similar kinds of projects are adopted because wildfires aren't confined to California, even though they might be really getting a lot of press from California now. The devastation to humans is substantial. But there are fires. If you look at fire maps, there are, which I do because British Columbia is often on fire. And, uh, you know, there are two fires really close to the small town that I grew up in that are, you know, that blackened the sky just yesterday mm-hmm. and, you know, caused my mom to say, I can't go outside because you can't breathe outside. And that is going to happen more and more and more. And not just birds are involved in trying to figure out how to survive those that kind of environment, but so are humans. You know, you have a baby that lives in that environment or and a pregnant women that are experiencing that. What does that do to developing fetuses? What does that do to little kids who are breathing that too frequently 
in their lives. I mean, we cannot ignore that this could be a way in which humans have to evolve to mitigate some of the the negative influences of, of what is natural. Fires are natural. Uh, fires this frequent, this hot, this big are not so natural in some of these areas. Mm -hmm. So it's really... Yeah, Amanda and I lived in Colorado together for a while, and there's always wildfire season out there. And then when we came to Chicago, we never thought, oh, this is going to affect us out here. And then you look at what's happening here in New York City earlier this year as well. I mean, it's unavoidable, it seems like, kind of no matter where you go. Yeah. Right. It's, it's unavoidable. And at the same time, it's also part of the ecosystem. So so they're actually also burning going on as, as a effective measure to control native habitats and bring back grasslands in situations where there historically were grasslands. Yeah, the answer are. is not to stop all fires. Um, you know, we've tried that. It doesn't go so well because the fires that go are now huge mm -hmm. uh, and way more destructive. And, you know, so a lot of things are adapted to fire. A lot of plants are fire adapted. But we do have to be careful as humans about what our behavior does to to some of these to influence some of these disasters. And and I think the most recent things that have happened from my perspective highlight the scale to p aspect of this too. So in California, that's a big factor in all this mm -hmm. is are we going to transition entire ecosystems away from the habitats that they've had for the last several thousand years as a result of more frequent fires and things. And so it's a big macroecology question that, that a lot of people are starting to look at uh, much more seriously. I mean, the same is true for flooding in other parts of the world, too. So there are these natural disasters that are increasing in their numerically, their frequency and their severity. And how, how, do, how does the world adapt? Well, yeah, for our California listeners, then, please help participate in Project Phoenix. You can find it online, not the extraterrestrial one. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's kind of a good place to stop. Does anybody have anything they want to add? I don't know. If somebody does see an extraterrestrial, let us know. Okay. <laughs> Especially if it has feathers and has pink and has wings. <laughs> that, that, that would be, yeah, get a photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, thanks, everyone. Thank you to Earhole Studios in Chicago for hooking us up with a place to record. We love Earhole. If you have a question for John, Shannon, Amanda, and I, feel free to send it to podcast.birdsofafeather at gmail.com or reach out to us on Instagram. Next week, we have a really special episode as we talk about the Willard's Sooty Boo Boo. You won't want to miss this episode. This is the species that John and his colleagues actually discovered. Hear about their trip to Africa and the process of discovering this bird in our next episode. 